In this video, we're going to take a look at Integrity's July challenge that was provided by Kavi Gian. I probably pronounced that incorrectly, I'm just going to say Kavi from now on. Anyway, the challenge runs from the 17th to 24th of July. We select six winners, and three of those are randomly drawn from correct submissions, three are for the best write-ups, and each of those will get a 50 euro swag voucher, and that's the same for the challenge creator as well. The solution should retrieve the flag from the web server, so quite often this will say that you need to pop an alert, so it's always worth checking this just to make sure that you know what the goal of the challenge is and also what the flag format is. More on this later, there was an issue with the flag format. And there are some rules here as well, just be considerate to other players. We use shared instances, so you don't have an instance per user. And in case that we don't set up the infrastructure correctly, we don't want you to try and delete files or mess around with the challenge in any way. Although that is really on us. If you do do that, then we will try to find ways to fix it in future. Anyway, let's jump into the challenge. You can scroll down. There is an iframe here with the challenge on it, but I'm going to open up the challenge page and we get through to this video audio extractor. There's not too much to look at. It says extract your audio from video files with ease and we can extract audio about us. Pretty simple. There's only one button to click on. We could have a look at the source and just see if there's any hidden links or comments in there, but there isn't. So let's go to upload a video. So we'll start just by testing the intended functionality. It tells us to upload an MP4 file. I downloaded a sample and made sure it was a small sample and we just upload it, click upload and extract audio and it'll take a second. We can go into burp and have a look at this as well. There's our post request with all our MP4 data. And we're just waiting for a response. So this should be extracting the audio from our video file. And there we go. We get this extracted audio, which we can also download. Let's just create a new file, actually. I'm just going to do touch fake.mp4. It's not an mp4 file. It's just an empty file. And we'll click upload. And this time we get this error message that wasn't supposed to happen. Hey, stop trying to break things. This is actually just a 500 error. If we go back here and have a look, you see... Oh, I didn't mean to do that. If we go back here, you can see this post request, the status is 500. And I'm going to send that to the repeater so we can play around with it. This was originally just a 500 error. And I just added this in just to let people know the challenge wasn't broken because a lot of the time people see the 500 error and just say, oh, there must be an issue with the challenge, I'll just skip it. So I just added this in just so there's a little bit of feedback to know that we do know that you will get a 500 error in many cases. And the case really here is just because we uploaded an mp4 file which didn't have any mp4 data, it's not an actual video file. So one of the first things that you might think here is to start trying to change the extension here. Can we upload a PHP file? In fact, let me go back and let's just actually upload a PHP shell. I've got a web shell here with a very basic... Actually, no, that's not it. Oh, we need to change this to all files. Shell.php, upload. And it says invalid file name, make sure it's an mp4 file and does not contain any white spaces in the file name. All right, so that's worth bearing in mind. Let's go back and just try and change this. If I do this to PHP, because we're changing the file extension to .php, but it's still content type mp4. So it might be that this works, let's see. And it doesn't, we get the same message saying it needs to end with .mp4. So there are various things you could do here. You could go and have a look at like port swiggers, insecure file upload, videos, maybe we can add like .mp4 at the end and then put something in here like null bytes or a new line, something like that, so that depending on how it's processed on the back end, it might be that the server side check first checks the mp4 is at the end, which it is good, but then actually strips out maybe anything after a null byte, maybe there's like a, that terminates a string. So we could try that, let's see. We get an internal server error, okay? So it's got the MP4, but there's no indication that it's actually uploaded the PHP file. And if it has, we don't know where it is either. We don't know whether it actually is able to process PHP. So even if we did find the PHP file, even if it was uploaded and we did find it, there's no guarantee that we could actually execute the PHP. But we might play around this for a while anyway and just see what kind of files we can upload, what kind of tricks we can do with the extensions and how that impacts things. We might also go back to the file that we downloaded. So we extracted some audio. I didn't actually play that there, but I don't have this video set to record system audio, so you wouldn't hear it anyway. But we could have a look at the EXIF data. Let's do EXIF tool on fake. No, that's not the right one. Let's do it on the extracted audio. And 
maybe there'd be something in here. There might be something with the like author that gives us a hint or a comment in here somewhere. We've also got the software, so I guess we could just go and take this to Google or DuckDuckGo and search for it and try and find out what it is. And we'll find that it is FFmpeg. So a lot of people started looking for vulnerabilities with FFmpeg, which is a perfectly valid route to take. And there are CVEs with FFmpeg, so it's not a bad idea to test this sort of thing. However, that's not what we're actually looking for. So if we think about what's happening on the back end, if you've got FFmpeg running, let me see, do I have it installed here? Do TLDR to get a list of example commands. And here's some example commands. So on the back end, here's extract the sound from a video and save it as MP3. So something like this is probably what's happening. And if that's what's happening, it's taking in the video name as this parameter dash I. So if that's running on the command line, maybe if we were to inject something in there, like if we've got ffmpeg i running and then video.mp4 is the name of our video. Why can't we just do like ls in here or ls like that? Well, let's try it out. Let's go back to burp where we've got this fake mp4 and let's try and inject something into the file name. We know we want to keep this mp4 at the end, but what if we just change this bit here and do, I'm doing back ticks, but you could try a variety of things here. Let us do ls and just see does it come back with anything. We'll do that, click on send, but we just get the 500 error again. So presumably if we're trying to run this command, ffmpeg is gonna fail. So if ffmpeg fails, then we get back this error. We don't get back any data from the command. In other words, it's a blind injection. So we could try then and do sleep. What if we do like sleep 10 and send that? And we get back an error because we've got a space in the file name. Let's try and URL encode the space. And we get back this error again, but it didn't actually sleep for 10 seconds. So there are various tricks we can use in Bash in terms of not using a space. One of them is to use this dollar sign curly braces IFS. So that is the same as a space. If I do LS and then CTF, oh, it's not going to also complete. There we go. So I've got a folder here called CTF and you can see that LS and then this was treated as a space CTF. So let's go back to burp and let's try and do that. Let's just put in here dollar sign curly braces IFS. There are various other tricks you can use by the way if you just look for like a cheat sheet on command injection there's various ways we can bypass the space. But you can see that it's taken a long time for the response to come back which is a good indication that our sleep command is being executed on the remote server. So at this stage you would probably start trying to use some reverse shells or maybe use curl to see if you can get a connection back to your own HTTP server. So for example, let's try and do it actually. Let's do curl and then we've got a space and then we'll do our HTTP and we actually need an address. So I'm going to go and create an ngrok server. Let me just make a new directory. And the reason I'm doing that is if I run the web server on my local directory and for some reason somebody gets the ngrok address they'll be able to access anything that's on my desktop. So that's it, we'll do that. We'll create a Python HTTP server and then we'll do ngrok HTTP 80. That's running on port 80 so it's just basically any traffic that gets sent here is going to be forwarded to our local host and we can take a copy of this. We can go back, paste that in there and click send. We don't get anything back and basically the reason for this is the Challenge is running a slimmed down Docker container. So it doesn't have curl, it doesn't have wget, it doesn't have netcat, it doesn't have a lot of other things that you would want to use to try and either get a reverse shell or to exfiltrate data. And that brings us on to the intended solution, which I'm going to show first of all. So I'm going to close down the ngrok server and the HTTP server. I'm instead going to use netcat, set up a listener. I'll do that on port 1337, and then we'll use ngrok to expose our TCP port 1337. And again, we'll get a address that we can use here. And now I'm gonna copy over an OpenSSL command. Let me split this horizontally. I'll minimize this so you can see a little better as well. And this was the intention. So we can create an SSL cert. I'm just copying and pasting that. So that was simply OpenSSL request and then the type that we want, the 
algorithm we want, the key size, we're exporting it to key.pem and cert.pem and then the length and stuff like that. I'll just put all these in as default values, but you have to be careful at the end. Oh no, I thought you had to say yes at the end. That's something else I'm obviously thinking of. And there we go, we've got our certs there. The next thing then is to actually run our OpenSSL server. I'm going to paste this in again. We're doing this on 1337. Actually, what am I thinking? We're already running our netcat on 1337. So I'm going to cancel that, close. So we're going to run OpenSSL on port 1337. This is already exposing our port 1337. So now we just need to send this over. I'm going to copy again the command which was provided by Kavi. And I'll open this up in Sublime just so you can see it. So here's the command. I'm going to change this then because we're doing this on port. Let's see what our. All right, so we're doing it on 13108, and this is the address. 13108. There we go. So that'll work fine, but we've got spaces in here. We've got a lot of characters in here as well. So we can go and base 64 encoder. You can either, you can do that in the terminal. I'm going to go to CyberChef. There we go, to base64, we can grab a copy of that and now send this through as a command. So let's keep this in the background so we can actually see when it gets the connection. And I'm going to go and paste this in here. We'll do echo and then we have our IFS and then we'll paste in our base64 encoded reverse shell. We'll pipe that through to base64 and then we need another space, so IFS and then dash D to decode, and then we're going to send that to bash. And we need our MP4 at the end, but that's all looking good. Let's send that and see if we get a connection. And we do. So notice we've got a connection. We can now list out the files, and we were told that the flag is at slash flag. Oh, actually, maybe we weren't told that. I can't remember now. But anyway, it doesn't take much enumerating. You can do ls dot dot slash and keep having a look around and you'll very quickly see that the flag is in the root directory. So we can just do cat flag.txt and there we get back the flag which is command injection and OpenSSL shell. Most people didn't solve this with an OpenSSL shell so they were probably confused whenever they got the flag and we'll have a look at some of the alternative solutions now as well. There were a couple of ways to get a reverse shell. I saw some people doing it with bash, I also saw people doing it with python as well. I'll not go through all the various commands that you could use to get a reverse shell, but it was anticipated to use OpenSSL. So if you did that, well done. Anyway, let's take a look at a completely different approach, one of which was to use blind data exfiltration. I'm going to copy a script here from LexAI. Let me call this brute.py. A few people created these scripts. And essentially, it's just kind of like if you've seen like a blind SQL injection script where you loop through each character in the flag and retrieve it either based on the time that it takes. So you can use time-based injection, you can use Boolean-based injection, which is what's being... Actually, in this case, we're using... Yeah, we're using Boolean. So we're looking for if the character is less than or equal... Sorry, less than or greater than the character that we're currently testing. So you can basically loop through the alphabet. You can start off like midway through the alphabet and say, is the first character of a flag less than M or is it greater than M? If it's greater than M, then you'll divide it again. So like a binary search, you're dividing from then M to Z. And you'll go in the middle and you'll say, is it above or less than that? And you'll keep doing that until you narrow it down. And that's what we're doing here. We've got a couple of functions. Is it greater than? Is it less than? Is it equal to? And this is where I made a mistake. So the, the flag originally had a typo in it, which is kind of annoying if you are taking this approach. We were expecting people to get a reverse shell, so it didn't really occur to me at the time and even after I spotted the typo it didn't occur to me so it was only after somebody left a message in one of their reports saying that actually they started the challenge like this which makes sense because you want to minimize the amount of time that it takes unfortunately the flag was like this so it didn't actually work if that was the case so yeah I apologize for that anyway let's save that I'm going to set that now that the flag has been corrected I'm going to set that as the initial string hopefully if we just do python Roots, it will start to recover the flag. Oh, that's not working because the flag index, my bad, let me go back. So the char index was first at zero, 
Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's set that to ten instead. Anyway, I speeded up the process there a bit. You can see that it is going to take a long time to retrieve a flag. Let's say I mentioned that they could have speeded up using parallel connections, but we've already got the flag anyway with a reverse shell. We can see it's going along the right lines. We've got a C and O, and then the next one is an M. So it is retrieving the flag, but yeah, it's a lot slower than the reverse shell option. Okay, the final solution that we're going to look at, which was also taken from Let's AI's write-up, and I really liked this one, this was to inject the flag into the metadata of the response. So we know from the beginning that whenever we upload a video file in MP4 format, it retrieves the extracted audio as an MP3 file. Well, what you could also do, because you know there is the command injection happening, so it's running the ffmpeg and it has the dash i with our input dot mp4. Well, we could actually inject here another option and there's an option in ffmpeg to take in metadata. So we could inject the metadata option here, dash metadata. Actually, you don't want to run it as a separate command. Well, we'd inject the dash metadata and then they've essentially used, so this is the base64 encoded cat flag.txt. So it's catting that into the metadata and then writing that to the file that was saved. So if we take a copy of this and let's go back to Burp Suite, let's paste this in here, send. It takes a little while to come back and we've got our extracted audio. I don't actually see the flag. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. So the flag is right here, integrity at the beginning. We could also save this whole thing as we did at the beginning and then just use EXIF tool to check the metadata on it. Okay, so just to recap, we had a command injection vulnerability. It was blind, so there was no output. We weren't able to get the output from our commands. And the goal was to get a reverse shell using OpenSSL. Only a couple of people did that. Most people either gained a reverse shell using Bash or Python, or they exfiltrate the data using the blind techniques, so time-based or error-based. There were some interesting solutions. I really like the last one that we looked at, the metadata extraction. And if you had a different solution that I've missed that you think was really cool or you saw one, do let us know in the comments. And as ever, make sure to send the write-ups to us so that we can share them on social media after the competition, or you can share them yourself and we'll be happy to retweet them. And also big thanks to the four people who submitted the write-ups quite early. We got LexAI, Marmius, CyberSecU, and Arne. And it really helps me in terms of making these videos. I don't always have a lot of time to look through all the possible solutions. So if you make a nice write-up and submit it early on, it helps me greatly. There were some lessons for us in terms of challenge creation for this one as well. I know there were some permission issues with some of the files that we had to resolve. There were some issues with error handling, whereby a couple of people were able to get the flag quite early on. And also, I guess, parts of this were a little bit guessy. I know Kavi had said that the Docker file should maybe have been included or accessible through directory busting or something like that, so that people would know what type of Docker container was running and therefore what solutions to look for. So if you know curl isn't there or wget isn't there, you'll know to try other things, for example. Apart from that, we had some infrastructure issues. So the challenge was quite unstable towards the beginning. And obviously there was a typo in the flag as well, which definitely affected the functionality for some people, depending on how you solve the challenge. So yeah, some lessons learned, but I hope you enjoyed the challenge anyway on this video. And if you have any questions or comments, as ever, leave them down below. Thanks.